Hi, it's Jackie from the Grown Ass Woman's Guide. As we work on brand new content coming soon, I wanted to share a few of our most popular episodes that are perfect for summer listening. And we'll be back soon with a whole new season. Happy summer. This has been a long time coming. You and I have been talking, I would say for months at this point about sobriety, our own journeys. And there's a reason we didn't do it sooner. Can we talk about that real quick? Yeah. So I recently celebrated my first year, full full 365 days, thank you. Amazing. Of sobriety. And you reached out to me after an Instagram post that I had kind of discussed on social media. And I was anxious because I I think I was at that point maybe like seven or so months into my sobriety. Yeah. And seven months was a pretty significant head start, but I was just so anxious and so trepidatious about like speaking about it where it's set somewhere permanently. Like an Instagram post, I could have deleted if I ever like <laughs> right. <laughs> fell short of the glory of the Lord, you know, but something like a podcast kind of stays there forever. And I really wanted to see if I could maintain yeah, my sobriety for a full 365 days. I am the type of person who will be like, oh, I'm starting the diet on Monday. Yeah. <laughs> and then by Taco Tuesday, I'm like <laughs> scarfing them down, you know? And then, 100%. So it's, yeah, it's the perpetual, I'll start on so-and-so date. And then just, yeah. just kind of moving the goalpost for myself. And um, this was a promise that I actually kept to myself for a full 365 days. So um, in yeah. celebration, kind of as like a, a gift to myself. I said, that's it. I'm putting it in infamy and I'm going to talk to Jackie about it. (laughs) I met Lauren Mack back in 2015 when I was working on a daytime syndicated TV show called Fab Life. Lauren stood out to me at the time as someone who was very much what you see is what you get, something I definitely admire, especially in that industry. And that hasn't changed in the past six plus years. In this episode, Lauren shares her journey to sobriety, what life looked like when she was drinking the excruciatingly painful moment when she knew something needed to change and what she's learned about herself in the one year since putting down that Jack Daniels bottle. I'm Jackie McDougall, and this is the Grown Ass Woman's Guide. I absolutely love when women over 40 share their must-have products in our Grown Ass Woman's Guide community. And I like to return the favor whenever possible. It's no secret that our bodies change as we age. And frankly, we need more lubrication in and out of the bedroom. I'm a huge fan of Coconut's coconut-based organic lubricant for those private moments and their hemp-infused body oil everywhere else. Use them together to help nourish your skin, soothe pain and discomfort, increase sensation, and ease tension so you can relax and enjoy being in your body. You can get both as a package deal for 10% off right now and use code GROWNASS at checkout and receive another 15% plus free shipping. Trust me, you will thank me later for real. Visit grownasswoman.guide forward slash kokanoo and use promo code GROWNASS. That's grownasswoman.guide forward slash kokanoo, like coconut without the T. I have been wanting to do this episode for a long time. And I have been terrified to do this episode for a long time. September 6th, 2021, nine months ago, 283 days as of this recording, I decided alcohol was no longer something that worked for me in my life. I'm just going to tell it to you straight. I myself was going through a really tough, somewhat dark time late last year, and I knew I would not be able to cope with any of it if I continued to drink. But that required a massive shift in my thoughts because I had spent a lifetime around drinking, not unlike Lauren. This for me was like something so big and so personal because for me, this sobriety thing, it goes back for me really, really deep. As I've been sober now, I kind of have like a zoom out lens of what's really going on with me and my dependency on alcohol. Mm. And it is generational for us. In my family, I mean, I I can't go back far enough where I don't see alcohol being pervasive in that generation. My great grandmother used to make hooch. They called it hooch back in Oklahoma. Mm. And she made it during prohibition when alcohol was illegal. So she was like the party girl, the house that everybody wanted to go to because she had the liquor. 
was kind of like a, a wild, wild west alcohol slayer, if you will. Good Lord. It sounds so funny to say. <laughs> and then my grandfather, my grandmother is like, and so many people in my family, like the cool people in my family that I thought were cool, the ones I wanted to go hang with that were smoking cigarettes and drinking beer in the garage. They were having yeah. fun and listening to music really loud. And they were the people that I associated with or wanted to be like. And so for me, when I think about alcoholism, right, mm -hmm. or an alcoholic, I think of someone who is like passed out on the floor and right. can't stand up and right. isn't functioning and yep. can't you know, keep a job, you, can't keep a job, living on the street. It has somehow like impeded on their life in a way that they can't function. I'm recognizing now that my dependency on alcohol was a lot more functional, but still just as dysfunctional in my life. Alcohol was a big part of Lauren's daily life growing up. Her dad would retreat after work to unwind with his screwdriver, more vodka than orange juice. Her mom would turn to a glass of wine or two. While alcohol didn't become a regular thing in Lauren's life until her early 20s, it was not unlike her dependence on other things. I've always depended on something, really, whether it be alcohol, marijuana, food, even relationships in my life, because I think there was, and I'll use the term as I can really clearly say it, a dis-ease within myself. And I just didn't mm. know. I don't know if it was a, a kid who didn't get enough attention or my exuberant personality needing all of that. I can't decide now, looking back as a parent now, was I not attended to enough or did I just need a lot of attention? Right, <laughs> so right, right. I can't, I'm trying to look back at that now because I have kids of my own. I'm like, damn, can you sit down and shut up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we see it different. Don't we? <laughs> right, you're right, exactly. Yeah. So, so there's that. I was overweight during high school and I, I don't know if it was a result of my marijuana and then eating a lot of food, but either way I was right. very heavy. And so I didn't have a dependency on alcohol at that point. I had a dependency mm. on marijuana. Okay. And when I turned 19, I had a gastric bypass and I lost over 140 pounds. So I was about 287 pounds going into my sophomore year of college. And so when my restriction of food kind of like curbed my dependency on, on food and, and things of mm. that nature, I, it quickly turned to alcohol. Mm. And so I think in about 22 or three, I started recognizing now I had changed my habits to something that was a little bit more easy to consume and was all liquid and, you know, mm. kind of fit the need for my now very small stomach. Yeah. And that's yeah. how addiction changes. It just metastasizes into something different, right? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, unless we're willing to look at the core reason and beliefs about ourselves that right. led us there in the first place, it'll just move from one thing to another, right? Oh, yeah. According to Psychology Today, a person with an addiction uses a substance or engages in a behavior for which the rewarding effects provide a compelling incentive to repeat the activity. But they also say individuals who develop an addiction may not be aware that their behavior is causing problems for themselves and others. And the pursuit of the pleasurable effects may dominate an individual's activities. I was a bartender and living in L.A. by myself. So, you know, I had nobody to rein me in and yeah. all of the freedom and this hot new body. So it was like a great life. I was bartending in some of the best clubs in L.A. And, you know, I just I was living my best life at 23 years old as, as I should. Right. I wish I could remember those 20s now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So at this point, you're feeling good about your body. You're out there. You're drinking whatever and whenever you want. Did you consider it a, a problem or were you just like, this is what you're supposed to do at 22? No, no, no. no. Yeah. I thought it was what I was doing at 22. It was, yeah. you know, same. I adapted Same. To the culture. Yeah, exactly. I, was just I relate. <laughs> yes. Okay, good. Yeah. I'm just living my best life. And listen, I still don't even think I had a real dependency on it at that point. It wasn't in the way. And I was having a great time. It was part of the lifestyle, the culture, and, and everything that was happening for me in those days and age. And I was able to go to work and all the things that anybody would do. Normally. And I think I was a normal drinker at that time. Okay. I could have a cocktail on Friday, Saturday night when I was at the bars or whatnot. And then Monday through Friday, I wasn't drinking regularly. It wasn't until, and I recall this very easily, a relationship that I was in where I felt very trapped and isolated. I had moved to San Diego uh, to be with this stupid boy and <laughs> found myself very quickly like, what have I done? I had no girlfriends. I was miserable. I had made a big mistake and I was in over my head quickly. And I remember at that point... <laughs> Big Lots used to have um, wine like by the jug and I would go uh -huh. there. It was like $3. <laughs> and I remember going there and just buying like $20 worth and stashing it in my trunk or in the garage and like going to the beach and drinking that wine because I was just lonely and bored. 
miserable. Mm. And um, I think that's where it kind of just started to pick up for me. So it was always a happy hour or a, a brunch or a, but again, it was so regular, so normal. It was so part of everyday life. Right. That I also associated alcohol with the social activities and yeah. with being with friends and, you know, not being alone. Margarita Monday or a Taco Tuesday or a <laughs> Hump Day Wednesday. There was always a right. special and a bar and a reason and an experience with it. And that for me was exhilarating. You know, I loved going out and having fun with my friends and having a happy hour after a long day of work. Yes. I mean, that's where the connection was at that age. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It was, oh, you just, you just bringing me back because right. Monday nights, we'd go to happy hour on Monday nights yes. and, you know, uh, Barney's Beanery and, and, and yes. LA and just like, yes. Also, Poco had margarita Mondays, two for one special. I can tell you every place in town, <laughs> right? And they could, they know me too. Yeah, you know, because it was just my like, it was just so much fun. You'd meet cool people and you'd have a good experience, and right, maybe you'd meet a cute boy, and, you know, go home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Without bars, I don't think I would have dated in my twenties. Exactly. It was like yeah. the tender of the times. It's just right. what I did, and I loved it. And you know, I'd always. The thing for me was I never had a DUI. I never got in trouble. It was never standing in my way, at least for what I thought. You know, I did never got me in trouble. So it was like, why is this a problem? Right. You were working. You were doing your thing. So yeah. when did you start to go, okay, I want to do on-camera work. I want to be oh, sure. Lauren Mack. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, actually I had been doing, I had done training spaces prior to that relationship. And so okay. that was my, my very first show ever. And let me explain, I, going back professionally, I was working as a, for a model home merchandising firm straight out of college, which we did all of the models for those big builds when you'd see a new neighborhood being built yep. in Southern California and Nevada. We'd do all the models. You know, you'd tour those first three houses with the flags hanging out in front. I designed those at a firm back in LA. So when the housing industry started to burst, probably in around 2005, 2006, of course, all the models were not being built any longer. And I started recognizing some of the junior designers getting let go. And I thought, oh boy, I'm next, right? Like mm. that's happening for me. And so I remember I had this sidekick phone, the one that swiveled around. You remember the first one with the internet? <laughs> yes. I'm really <laughs> myself, honey. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm 51. So you're good. You've got, I'm, I've right. got some years on you. <laughs> all, right, all right. Fair enough. So, so I, I had this sidekick phone. And I remember sitting in my car on a lunch break, looking at Craigslist, which is also mm. an antiquated website for, it was like the classifieds mm. of the time. And I was looking for a job and I just typed in interior designer and an opportunity to audition for a trading spaces like television show came up. So I said, you know what? Mm. I got all these great portfolio of all of my work that I had from my model homes uh, designs. And I just was like, let me just see what happens. I don't ever done television before in my life. That wasn't my goal. But I went down there and I, I killed the interview. I killed the audition. Mm. And so that's how that started for me. I got it. It actually turned out to be trading spaces. And so I auditioned, got the show, and that was my first first ever television show. So I did that for three seasons, and it was great, which was a huge show at the time. It was like yeah. the biggest design show. This is before HGTV and all of the other networks that yep. do that. Yep, this I was a, a fan. TLC. Yes, exactly. <laughs> a Saturday special on TLC, you know? Yep. But then they, they, they canceled the show, and it was like, okay, here's the end of that show. There's the end of that whole experience for me. What does that look like? And so I was doing some minor little, I went back to what I knew best bartending at a hot nightclub in LA because I could make thousand dollars a night, you know, and right and drink, which you didn't yes. want to do that, you know, <laughs> for free <laughs> and for free and party with the best people, out, you know, in the world. I mean, I can't tell you it was so Hollywood, you know, mm. I, I went back to that and that, that's actually how I met the, the boyfriend that I ended up moving to San Diego to be with. So ah. then I had been removed. So that was like this whole merger of like loss of my, my career, not knowing what was next. I won't even say loss, but mm. not having the next step. And then also being in this relationship with this person, which is kind of, you know, at the time I thought drinking was fun. So I didn't associate it with maybe even like grief. I probably just drank so I didn't feel bad about where, the yeah. uncertainness of things. Mm. And, and looking back, I recognize that probably was a, a main component that I probably didn't, that I probably ignored or just didn't have the maturity or the language to recognize at the time. Right. And so how long did you, did you just stay in that? Did it sort of implode? Did you decide? Oh, please. I got the hell out of there. Yes, I got out of there one day. Let me pack this U-Haul and get the hell out of here. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> and took my butt back to LA. Um, yeah. But, you know, in that, you know, after that, there was a series of other, you know, television ups and downs, whether it be, you know, a stint on a show that I've moved to Philadelphia in and 
I want to, but no matter what, steadily, of course, my career was gaining momentum and, and that was, you know, exciting and, and fun too. But I have to say that that gave me another reason to also depend upon Al Gore because I was nervous. I felt um, yeah. like I was in the wrong room sometimes. I'm a black girl from Oklahoma and here I am sitting next to X, Y, Z. You could name any big <laughs> name and there they were. Right. From politicians to top TV stars, musicians, like being on Fab Life, which was my biggest, I guess, achievement or biggest, I'd say, name brand show, which was a talk show uh, on ABC, as you well know. <laughs> I do. For all those who are listening, Bad Life was a show that Jackie and I fell in love That's on. how we met. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing promos uh, for Fab yeah. Life. And I just remember you had been on TV, but you were also brand new. I mean, here is a syndicated yes. show. Right. Next to Chrissy Teigen, Tyra right. Banks, and right. obviously Leah and Joe. But at that point, I had been in this business since, like, I started working on TV in 1993, syndication in 1999. So like, wow, I'd been doing this a while. I've worked with a lot of talent and it was just my view was, wow, number one, I could see your future in front of you. I could see you and I could see Leah and I could see like, oh, they've got a future in front of them. And at the same time, I don't know if it was the mom in me or what it was, but I was like, I can only imagine what it feels like to go from what you're doing, working on camera, on TV, but now being on TV and what that might trigger in a person. Yeah. I didn't know you at all. Yeah. Um, right. So it was really just questions like curiosity. Yeah. And so now that I actually get to ask you, like, what did that feel like now that you'd be recognizable? Or, yeah. I mean, daytime yeah. is at that time still pretty big. <laughs> yeah, it really was. I mean, gosh, I don't put this. That was and still is one of the best and most brilliant experiences that I can. I am. So, I feel so blessed that I get to say that I even did that, even if it was for a year. I wish it had gone on for 25, mm. like Oprah. But <laughs> <laughs> even if it was for one year, it was such an incredible experience to just, you know, be able to reach people. What I learned from that show is how not alone I am. Mm. I think, though, that I'm still processing that because I still feel like that's part of what leads to me feeling like I need to depend on something other than myself whether it be food or alcohol or any of the other things that I love to do, like mm -hmm. shop, <laughs> whatever it is, you know. But being on that show, I could say something and it felt like it was one dimensional or there was just the audience there. But what I learned was that millions of people were watching it and would relate mm. and would be like, I felt that way too. I experienced that too. I felt like that too. And you're like, oh, great. Ah, it feels so singular because it's just you and you're going through it in that moment. But right. there was an, a community that was able to be built based on that. And, and what an experience, boy. I, I, you know, as I explained, I, I'm from Oklahoma City and there are not a lot of people that get out of that and be able to have a, a microphone that big. So it was an incredible experience and still is. Yeah. There's still yeah. some, some, all, still there's some great fans that still are friends of mine now on Instagram and through <laughs> social media. And we still talk. It's a, it's a high that's hard to chase. But God, what a ride when you're on it. And also, too, just recognizing that I belonged because there's this something in me or in a lot of, I think, regular people who haven't grown up in that business or industry that feel like, I don't fit in here. Or, you're like an Emmy Award winning musician and I'm just <laughs> sitting next to you like, but those people are just people, too. Yeah. And witnessing that people like uh, Tyra, who's grown up in this industry, witnessing her regular humanity it was really, really, really cool to see. Yeah. So... Did it contribute to any feelings within yourself about yourself? We talk about imposter syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. We talk about feeling not enough. Like here you are mm -hmm. sitting next to these people who've been doing this for years. Did it trigger any of that? And did it include alcohol at that time? Yes. Like what did your, your, your relationship with alcohol look like when you were on that show? I was a drinker every day. I think it was safe to say that like after work, I would go well with my girlfriends and we would have dinner somewhere. We would have a couple of glasses of wine and like, that was very regular. It didn't feel unusual. I've always had cocktails after work. I mean, that's just yeah, yeah, always yeah. it. I, it wasn't didn't feel bad. I do know, however, that we went to a big meeting in, in New York City. ABC flew all of us out to New York City. Mm. I think it was uh, for all of the people who were advertising. Okay, like the upfronts. Yeah, like an upfront. And we had, they had a big party. This is how mm. green I am. I can't even remember the name. We had a big party at the end of the yep, night. Yep. And um, Tyra and Chrissy Teigen was there and John Legend was there and, and Leah and Joe and I'm sure a room full of other people I barely recall, but I was nervous. And to calm my mm. nerves, I'm sure I had a couple of shots of Jack Daniels in the hotel while I was getting ready. And I'm yeah. 
certain I had a couple of cocktails at the party and it was me and Chrissy and John. And, you know, Chrissy was at the time quite the drinker and right. John would participate too. And they were mine, knew everything. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I had to have a couple of cocktails with them to still the nerves. And I also had on some huge platform shoes, which I had no business <laughs> walking in, honey. <laughs> and those New York shoes were not kind. Right. Because they're cobbly and wobbly and everything else. And so. Right. Let's mix the combination of the three. Too many cocktails, the highest shoes on earth, and the worst streets ever. So I'm sure that at the end of the night, I was holding on to someone for steadiness, okay? Mm, yeah. Needless to say, it wasn't interpreted as if all of those three things existed. It was interpreted back on Monday morning in the headquarters that Lauren was drunk and needed to be drugged out at the club. Mm. And there could be an intersection of all of those truths, <laughs> you know? I had a conversation in a meeting mm. with some of the executives who warned me, like, listen, this lifestyle will chew you up and spit you out. And it's important to like not take it overboard when you're in a meeting or a special space where people are, where all eyes are on you. Yeah. And when that meeting happened, I remember sort of being like, well, my shoes are wobbly and Chrissy was doing it. Why can't I? And, you know, I mean, all of the other excuses, but none of those things mattered, you know? And um, that person who had a conversation with me is my dearest friend, Jill Mulligan Bates. Mm. who And also one of my closest friends. <laughs> right. Who, who I have actually attributed so much of my success in sobriety to her because I didn't pay attention to her words then, but I didn't forget them. Mm. And she said, you're not Chrissy Teigen, okay? You're Lauren Mack and you're meant for more. And you have to be aware of who's watching. And she's like, I'm telling you this because I want you to be the best you can be. I want to see you win. Mm. And it was very maternal. It was very loving, but it was very direct. And at the time I was like, yeah, yeah, okay. Note to self, don't drink in public. (laughs) Or put your ass on some flats. (laughs) Okay. Maybe both. (laughs) All three. But but more importantly, I have taken that and now I really hear her message. And that is people are watching you and what someone else can do. That's on them. You need to be staying your lane and watch yourself and do what you got to do for you. Mm. And I called her when I became sober and I thanked her. We continue to talk often, but I always tell her if there's a milestone in my sobriety, I always let her know that she's a reason for it because she was loving and kind and very honest with me in times when people probably felt they couldn't be as honest. Yeah. And I appreciate that, you know? So. Yeah. Wow. But I interpreted it then as like, hey girl, calm down. It was, you know, I wasn't (laughs) drunk. I wasn't as drunk as I could be. (laughs) Right. Right. You're like, you have not seen anything yet. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) You have no idea how much I can party. Yeah. Watch this. Hold my beer. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I could totally relate to that. Yeah. Yeah. On January 19th, 2016, Fab Life was canceled. But in a surprising turn of events, that was not Lauren's greatest concern. I had at the time a a boyfriend, a very like non-important boyfriend. He was just somebody that liked to take me to dinner and tell me I was pretty and that was enough for me. Mm. (laughs) Food and compliments, carry on. (laughs) Where do I show up? (laughs) Exactly. And so he was a guy that I was, I wouldn't even say dating. Like I said, I let him take me out to dinner and tell me I was cute. That was around, you know, the holiday time. So right after the holidays, we came back to Fab Life and we found out that we were not getting picked up for season two. And that was, let's say, like a Monday. And that Thursday, I found out that I was pregnant. Oh, what a week. (laughs) What a week. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And so needless to say, I had a new focus to really concern myself with post yeah. um, the show. Coincidentally, that person, my son's father, caught me at a weak moment during that holiday season, you know, and uh, wine late in Christmas Eve. This is, that's how I got pregnant because it, was, mm. it only took one good time for he and I to conceive. And so that was my new focus. So losing the show wasn't the greatest thing on your mind at that time, I, I assume. That's correct. Yes. No, it was not. <laughs> yes. I had a, quite a lot ahead of me. And, and you know, what? I, I really thought that some of the fuel of that show would, uh, I would instantly go into something else that was just as big. Right. And 
it, it's been a challenge to find something in that same level of, I don't even want to say success because there's been great successes. I just would say there's nothing been quite like that level. So that was a big level to get to. But also daytime 2015, 2016. I mean, there's still daytime shows on, obviously successful, but at the same time, I think we were in that intersection of like more cable, more yeah. digital, more streaming. Yes. Yeah. So I think Fab Life was one of those things where they were like trying to hold on to daytime and like spend all this money and have these big budgets and all this stuff going on. But yeah. the audience was changing. Yes, it was. And so my prediction, we listened to this back in 2030, right? Right. right. <laughs> I don't know that daytime, like, I don't know that that's where it's going to be. I agree. Where is the next big thing is a great question, but podcast. Hello. <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> duh. So you, you know, you're pregnant. How did that, and, and by the way, you can tell me that uh, anything you don't want to answer or, or sure. edit out, but like, how did that look at your drinking? Were you just, was it easy to just stop? Did you struggle? Yeah. What did pregnancy do? Pregnancy was, that's interesting that, and I, I, this is where it's like, it's, I'll, I'll be very honest because that's what my intention for this whole um, experience of being with you here on, on this podcast is about. Pregnancy for me was not stop drinking. Okay. Pregnancy for me was one glass of wine. Like my doctor said it was okay. Mm. Or like I could read on the internet. And I am in a lot of guilt about that looking back because God, that should have been an indicator then that something, that there was a bigger thing happening here. Mm. But it was like, I think a lot of moms, I mean, has so many people be like, Oh girl, my mom drank them six martinis when she was pregnant with me. <laughs> You'll be fine. And then it would be like, oh, we could have one glass of red wine. It was like this sort of like negotiation about how much you could do versus, hey, why don't you just give yourself a break for nine months? Can you just right. take, a, take a time out for nine months? Like, can you just do that? And I do recall it feeling inconvenient to be pregnant because it was slowing up my lifestyle, which was fun and going out. So I, I could say that I definitely had a glass of wine. I didn't take it to the max like I used to, which was a bottle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or two. <laughs> or a jug from Big Lots. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I would have a glass of wine, you know? Yeah, yeah. And like for me, if I had a wine spritzer, that was me. Mm. I could have two of those because it was just that whole aspect of being social and like wanting to like, like I said, just cure the dis-ease of the, you know, I was listening to you to your podcast recently, and one of the, your guests was said, mentioning how they take five minutes out of their day and just be with themselves. And I thought, huh, I could do five minutes. And then as I sat there thinking more and more about it, I thought, I don't think I could do five whole minutes of just sitting there. I would feel insignificant or that I needed to, I could have gotten this thing checked off my list in five yes. minutes. And why would I just sit here for five minutes or you know what's going on? I'm going to check my Instagram. I'm going to post something. Let me see what so-and-so is talking about. Let me read the news. Let me watch the news. Let me do these dishes. Like all of these things in my head, I, sitting with myself, even in those five minutes, I would shame myself. Mm. And so I think, and that's now through therapy and healing, I'd, I'd still find a little bit of right. discomfort in those five minutes. So imagine being unconscious and unaware of all of the generational shit, all of the personal feelings I had, and then loss and everything else. I, I don't know if I... Yeah. And then pregnant... Yeah. Just lost your dream job. Right. And single. And single. Yes, I was. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were together and dating, but yes, not married and definitely still like, what the hell have I done? I got pregnant by a man I knew up for a month <laughs> and I'm having his baby and I got no job. Yes. And I got a mortgage that's insane. You know what I mean? And then I'm like right. doing it all alone. Yeah, that was a lot of that. Without the ability to go to your crutch. Absolutely. <laughs> and I, don't forget that I had all the perfect reasons to drink at that time. You know, like mm -hmm. I was like, this is it. And so I remember when Preston was born, the first thing that I said was like, bring me some Jack Daniels. I wanted sushi mm. and Jack Daniels. I wanted a cocktail and food. <laughs> My two favorite things, right? Yeah. And again, I remember even reading in the mom blogs, like when you're reading like, you know, all the things that there's all these blogs and the girls would say, I had my husband bring me a bottle of wine and a, and a turkey sandwich in the hospital. And I was like, oh yeah, okay. I got my whole list of what I want, like a last meal, yeah. you know, <laughs> you know, yeah. it was my yeah. first meal. Permission. You know? Exactly. Yes. And a green light. And so I remember that and like right back where I started from, thank you, here we are. My good old Jack Daniels yeah. and, and Diet Dr. Pepper was my disgusting combination. <laughs> of drink. But you didn't think at that point still like that there was much of an, a problem. So, no. so where do you think it was that you were like, 
oh, maybe this is not serving me. Mm. Right. Let's fast forward. The pandemic has hit and Lauren is nine months pregnant with her second baby, her son born less than two weeks after the world shut down. I had the baby and came home and now everything had stopped and I had every reason on earth to drink. Anxiety, depression, <laughs> I would think a little mild version of depression. I was never diagnosed. I was certainly sure I was depressed because everything that I had lined up for that year financially was wiped off the table. Oh, wow. I now have two kids that I'm raising and responsible for. And so when I was drinking before to have fun and to engage and to be social, all of that was gone. And now I was just drinking at home alone, mm. like a lot of people. And now in 2020, you can get it delivered. I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not driving around. I'm not out here yeah. in the streets. Like now it's like a whole other thing. And it turned from being this really fun, exciting, exhilarating experience to something a little bit more sinister and dark and sad. And that's not ever the reason why I picked up drinking. I picked up drinking because I want to have fun and be with the cool people yeah. and like be pretty and be party and smart and fun. Yes. <laughs> but you know, you're always the party girl until you're not. Yeah. I was a 38 year old sad drunk when <laughs> I was mm. not a 21 kids. year. Yeah. With two kids. Right. I didn't realize that initially I was just drinking at home like everybody was. And it was kind of like the funny joke in the world that everyone's at home drinking. Yeah. It had now become like an even more cool thing to do with drinking at home because everyone was doing, we're bored as hell and scared as hell and anxious as hell. And, you know, I think everyone can relate to that. And the messaging from the culture was very much like oh, girl. wine and you could have wine anytime. I mean, it was the pandemic. You could have wine at noon if you wanted to. Like, exactly. It, there were there were no more rules, right? There was no and so rules. I uh, we'll get into it. Oh, the whole attitude of mommy juice and all that oh, yeah. bullshit that's out there, but especially yeah. in a pandemic. So oh, I can yeah. imagine that it, it doesn't feel all that off because look, it's the messaging out there. The world is like, it's okay. Everybody's doing it. Girl. You have a free pass. Yeah, <laughs> please kind of like leveled the playing field for everybody too so we were uh -huh. all broke we were all sad we were all discouraged <laughs> right <laughs> so it's like drink up <laughs> you know cheers and cheers mm. finally you know it was the one thing mm -hmm. that we could all agree we would get together and have the zoom drinking parties don't you remember yep. everybody would be oh, on the zoom i do yeah and you're just sitting there <laughs> drinking wine talking shit and laughing with yep. somebody who's in timbuktu <laughs> it was beautiful yeah. It was actually quite lovely to be really honest with you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I really was. I agree. But there were also moments where it wasn't. I was like sitting yeah. in a shower, drinking, crying, you know, and it's like, mm. uh, this ain't that. This ain't what it used to be. But what really changed for me was a moment that I also think that a lot of people can relate to. And that was um, betrayal. In 2020, my two children and I, we moved to Nashville to be with my second son's father, who's now my husband's. We were together, not married, but engaged. Actually, it was Cinco de Mayo, and it was a Taco Tuesday, and I was with my girlfriend, my neighbor, and we were fucked up at noon, because why not? <laughs> it was a reason to drink. It was Cinco de Mayo, mm -hmm. and I don't know what it was. Well, I do know what it was. It had to be a power higher than me, I say. And out of nowhere, I just had this instant feeling. I remember where I was sitting and what I was doing. I was drinking my margarita. And I had this instant where power said, your, your partner's not being faithful to you. Mm. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. But it was a voice that I couldn't quiet down. And it had come out of nowhere. I'd never suspected him of being unfaithful to me. Mm. And so through a series of events, I came home and started investigating because that's what I'm good at, honey. You can call, I really need to be in the FBI. <laughs> <laughs> started, started a full-fledged investigation out of nowhere. I don't know, again, what it, what it was true, that he hadn't been faithful to me. It wasn't like, you know, some girl he was seeing, well, actually it was, but it wasn't like it was just sex according to him, right? Mm. Which I don't know why that maybe felt better or worse. I don't know. I'm still processing that part of it too. Yeah. However, what I do know in that moment was that same voice that told me to trust my instinct was also telling me that if I picked up a cocktail that I was going to end up in jail before the end of the day. Mm. Because my personal self was saying, oh my God. I'm out. I'm on, something's wrong. I'm having a bad day. I need to have a drink. And something bigger than me said, you put that drink in your mouth and it all, everything's going to shit. Cause I was going to kill that woman and I was probably going to kill him too. Mm. And I think, and I, I mean that with sincerity. I don't mean yeah. I'm saying it as like a cute little quip. I was going to kill yeah. her. I have watched enough Dateline <laughs> and enough 2020 to know how everybody else does it wrong. And I was going to do it right. Mm. 
the rage and that intensity was so unfamiliar and scary to me that I knew that putting any amount of alcohol on top of that was going to add something way worse. And I thought, wow. I'm not going to let somebody take me away from my kids. So I left Nashville for, to be honest with you, I was a little bit out of control at that point. So I don't recall exactly how long, but long enough to get my head together before I had to come back home. And I was so intensely angry at him because we had gone through all of this therapy together to change our relationship and to rewrite the narrative and to be this family for our children. And here he was being duplicitous, right? He, he wasn't doing what he said. He needed this comfort. And of course, and, and I want to give some grace to him. Let me be really clear. My partner had an addiction as well. It was a sex and love addiction, right? Mm. Which he is now experiencing his own recovery, sobriety all and, and recovery. And yes, exactly. I was so angry with him for doing that to me and knowing damn well that we were doing all of these things to get better and to be more conscious because our, our actual therapy is called conscious relationship therapy. And then in that same moment, as I'm so mad at him, I think to myself, well, are you conscious? You're not. I have my own addiction. I'm completely drunk from probably three o'clock until I pass out at the end of the day. Mm. And I, I had to stop and sit with myself about that because I'm so mad at him for having this thing, this secret, this addiction, this thing that he wasn't clearing up, but I know good and damn well that I have now started to sneak a beverage or I'll just say check out. I was checking out too, mm -hmm. you know? And I recognize that if I don't start checking back in, if, I, if this was out of control for me and I wasn't checked in with this, then there's probably other places in my life that I'm checked out of that I'm not aware is happening. If I could not see that happening in my own space, then where other places is that happening? Mm. And so I did get really still. <laughs> I was meditating one morning and I was so agitated. I didn't know like how to be in my home around him with my children. Like I was just so like out of control in my own body. I was sitting right next to my home bar, <laughs> right? Wanting another drink. But I didn't even, at that point, I didn't even want another drink. I almost needed it. Like if there were days when I didn't want a drink, but I still felt like I had to. Yeah. I remember even like about, about to pour that drink and I was like, I don't want this, but I felt like, uh, just, I was still Your doing it Your subconscious is like, but yeah. this is what we do, Lauren. Yeah. Pour like, it, pour you it. You don't feel good. It'll make you everything better. Drink. Exactly. Yeah. You don't feel good. Yeah. You should have a drink. And I'm like, no, but this drink is not going to make me feel better. And then I was like, yes, it is. We're going to do great. Right. You know? right. It's like that, that, the devil and the angel, right? Like, yeah. And I was, yeah. and I sat there and I was like, I just gave it to God and I said, okay, please help me. Just help me. Help me. I remember saying, please just help me. And I remember this voice. It was clearer than anything I've ever heard in my life. And it said, how do you expect me to help you when you can't help yourself? Oh. Like, how do you expect me to use the gifts I'm giving you if you're too numbed out, too checked out to even use them? And I was like, oh, right, 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 right. So that day I was like, fuck. <laughs> it was like so loud and clear. I couldn't even not say mm. that I had heard it because it was so clear. It was so evident. Like you have really found yourself in this position where you are like planning a double homicide on one side of your brain, but in the yeah. other brain, like you can't even get control. And it was just like, I was so out of control. Was like, I was literally out of control. At this point, Lauren knew she needed help, but she could not do it alone. I knew I wanted to go to A and I looked it up before. I, I kind of like had an idea of where they might hold a meeting or when it could be, but I made all these excuses about why I couldn't be there at that time. I got two kids. I can't be up at 7.30. I'm, you know, oh, during the day, oh no, I've got these yeah. things and I'm too important, right? Because I can't yeah. take care of myself. I've got more important things to do than take care of. And then I was like, well, who am I calling? Do I have any friends that are sober? And the answer was typically no, because um, why would I hang out with sober people? I like to have fun. You're a loser. <laughs> <laughs> totally get that. Right? Totally like, get that. No, I don't have sober friends. They're, well, they wouldn't yeah. be friends. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So. I remember thinking that like, if someone was sober because they have a problem, I could be friends with them because they get the, the appeal or if someone's a drinker, but someone who just chooses not to drink, like what's wrong with you? Why would I be your that friend? That was what my brain also, you know? Yes. That's how hard it was when I was trying to come out of that. I was like, I have nobody to call. Yeah. Because that ain't my community. That, that was not my bird that I could right. be a flock with, you know? And by the way, drinkers don't necessarily want you to get sober right. because they'll lose their partner. Exactly. But then are they really your friends? 
Right. Are they really your friends? And that's what I'm also learning. Like so much of the people that I thought were my friends are just weren't, you know, they were yeah. my butt and my yeah. drinking buddies. And I get that. Right. Thing. You have somebody for everything. So I did what I, I went back to the archives. We had this old friend from Fab Life, mm. Antonio Martinez. He I was love Antonio. Isn't he wonderful. <laughs> and he was the only person I remember mm. being backstage with him and I, I, me and another fab lifer who shall not be named, but I actually think she's on her sober journey. So I'll just say it, I guess. Chrissy Teigen. <laughs> we used to go backstage and we'd have a couple cocktails together. She was my drinking buddy. Okay. Yep. And I remember she and I were like having like a little like giggle fest. We had just like, I don't know, probably both did the wine together. Right. And we offered him some and he was like, no, I'm sober. And I was like, oh, gross. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> loser <laughs> yeah yeah judge, all right judge you know and i remember thinking he's sober that's weird but he and i had always kept up through the years whether it be social media or just touching base yep. and so i thought oh i do know one loser <laughs> 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 let me call him you know so i i pick up the phone it was the hardest phone to pick up that day and i said hey man I, you know i want to think about sobriety like can you give me some direction or what are your thoughts on the wow. first thing he really did help. He gave me a direction and he told me some really important things to like remember just for that day, just for that moment. So that day I didn't drink. And the next day I went to AA and I walked in and you know, we're in Nashville. Okay. And I'm in the suburbs. So let's just say I got to the door and I walked in and I was like, Oh, am I in the right place? I thought I was there for a Trump rally. <laughs> <laughs> I think my head, I was like, well, this can't be it. I must have introduced myself to the wrong room. I said, well, yeah. frankly, if I were at a Trump rally, I'd be drinking too, but that's a totally <laughs> different thing. Yes, yes. yes. I think you I'm like, this ain't my crowd. I said, uh, yeah. we're in the right place. And she said, if you're a drunk, you are. And I thought, ah, okay, I'm, I'm okay. I'm in the right place. Wow. So I sat down and I just sat there and just sat there and cried the whole time. And it was my first meeting. So of course they do a whole first meeting for first timers. And I just cried. I don't know what they said. But I know for sure there was a few little things that I could take from that meeting. It was like, you know, just all I got to do is just survive right now in this moment, right now. You don't have to worry about when you're never going to drink again. You just worry about right now. And so yes. that was what it took. And I, I would go back and I would cry and cry and cry and just go back and cry. And, and then I stopped crying <laughs> maybe two weeks in that I could finally muster who I was and where I was from. And, and then I just kept going back. Why do you think it was so emotional for you in the beginning? Oh, man, Jackie. Was it a loss? Yeah. It's just a change, you know? It's just like, it was everything. It was so unfamiliar to be there. It was so hard to admit that I had a problem that I didn't know where to start with. You know, I, I consider myself so able to do anything in this world. Like, yeah. I can I can work my way all the way up to television, national television, if I wanted to. I can do anything. This one thing seems so impossible. And I really didn't want to stop drinking. I don't really want to stop. I knew I had to, but I was so scared to let go of what that looked like for me, whether it was the lifestyle or the friendships or the experiences, like everything I've ever done from 23 years old till now had been with alcohol, vacations, holidays, afternoons, dinners, out to eat. Yeah. God, even at church, (laughs) they give you wine. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> totally and then like even with small kids you invite people to the first birthday and and there's alcohol at this Girl, first birthday party and i was fucked you know? up on my kid's first birthday i thank god i have a camera to show me the pictures but yes yeah you know and i mean I, it's not and i don't want to listen i i think it's important to take personal responsibility i think it's accountability it's it's 100 percent so important right and and i'm i'm guessing aa helps you do that but also the messaging out there, the societal like drinking, 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 like that's mm-hmm. what makes you fun. It's wine mm-hmm. o'clock, you know, mm-hmm. it's mommy juice. It's oh. all of these things that are out there that if you are someone who wants to be sober or who struggles with alcohol, I don't want to say it's not 100% your fault, but they don't make it easy. No, they don't. And so true. Because I was even at Ross the other day and I was like walking through the aisles and there was like all these like aprons and like uh, you, yeah. towels for your kitchen and every one of them had like a glass of wine on it like it's wine o'clock it was, it's it's yeah. five o'clock somewhere you know like you yep, said the mommy exactly. juice cup so and I have subscribed to that girl you know I remember my son asking if he could play soccer and the first thing I thought was I don't want to drink outside in the heat 
Right. I want to drink on a soccer field with all the bugs and the heat. Like, no, you cannot play soccer because I don't want to be, I'm uncomfortable <laughs> drinking there. Like, that's not my first thought, you know? Right. And it's like, even just when I've had a long day, like, I remember just like Pavlov's dogs being like, oh my God, I, I need a drink. Like, I need it. Yes. Not I want it. Yes. Not it would be nice. I need it. Like, that was my messaging to myself. So, and I still find myself sometimes like joking about a cocktail, like, oh, see, I have a cocktail. Like, as a joke, but that's not even like how I think anymore. It was just so ingrained in my head. Yes. This programming. You get programmed at a young age that yes. it's like, oh, the drinkers are the fun ones. The yeah. drinkers are the ones you want to be around. Yeah. And also as a host, like I love to host things. And it certainly makes it easier when you've got a drink in your hand, right? When you're trying to connect people to each other oh, and, yeah. and and host it all. Otherwise, yeah. it's just the work without the pleasure. Hello? Like, <laughs> and then you got to clean up. When you're fucked right. up and drunk you're on like, the floor, someone else does it for you. <laughs> right. You're like, why did why do I host? It's so awful. Like, but, really? but when you've got a drink in hand, like so yeah. there's a lot. And you're right, like with COVID and quarantines, you'd yeah. sit outside. Like, at least we would in California. And it was the only way to be social and be on these Zoom calls right. or whatever. So a lot of people don't have that. I'm about to kill two people moment. Right. But they have some version of that. Yeah. Some version of like shit, this needs to change. So from that moment when you got sober and you went to AA, was that it? Was your sober journey on or did you you hit some bumps along the way before you got sober finally? Oh, well, first of all, let me just say the clear, it's not that cute and packaged. Of course, that was the first day of my sobriety. Yes. Okay. But keep in mind, mentally, there had been many, I'm going to stop on Mondays for Mm. at least a decade, you know? Okay. I, I certainly, I can surely clearly tell you when I had that meeting with Jill <laughs> back at, in my ABC Fab Live days, there, there were definitely days like, oh, you know, I'm going to go to this event. I'm just going to have one cocktail. And then I don't. Yeah. That day at AA was the first day I stopped lying to myself. Mm. But I had lied to myself and been attempting sobriety forever, yeah. I would say. Every time yeah. that I would embarrass myself or hurt myself, overcommit or do something inappropriate or wake up and forget or lose something, all of those things, all of those whispers up and until that moment, I had always said, I'm going to stop drinking. On Monday, I'm going to quit. I'm going to take it easy. I'll just drink on the weekends. All these little mini negotiations that I had had with myself that I was never living up to. So my sobriety journey could probably go back till the very first time I lied to myself. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you right now, I am not a one drink girl. Hell no. I, I, I feel like one drink is for quitters, you know, like, <laughs> hey, that's, I just, exactly. I brush my you teeth know, with I, a cocktail. <laughs> and, and yeah. And so for me, I don't go to AA and, and I am from a family of alcoholics. I have siblings who are sober and who have, and for me, I was like, well, I didn't get busted. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. Like, mm-hmm. and my husband and I would share a bottle of wine and I knew in my head, I, I had already pre-negotiated that we only have one bottle of wine because if I open the second bottle of wine, nothing good is happening. So right. I'm drinking half a bottle of wine, but here's the thing. My husband's not that much of a drinker. Mm. And so we would share this bottle and then he'd go up to do, to you know, whatever, get ready for bed or something. And he'd have a glass with like half full, which I did not understand. How? Like, and so to me, even if I was just about to go to bed, I would shoot down his Hell wine yeah. because you don't waste wine. Like have no. respect, you know, don't you dare <laughs> pour it out and just leave it. Right. Right. And I'm the same way with food. Exactly. Like to leave that bite of food. So don't you always regret it too when you leave that last bite and then you're hungry later? I left cheesecake on that plate. <laughs> Why would I do that? It's, it's, so it's, to me, I have a disordered relationship mm-hmm. with alcohol. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I don't, I don't want to be lying to myself and, and like, what's the difference between that and alcoholism? I have no idea. And exactly. they say, are you an alcoholic? Well, do you think you're an alcoholic? I mean, it's really a self- diagnosis, right? Alcoholism. Right. And so I just know that I had a really, really unhealthy relationship with it. Like if you were to invite me to dinner, I'd go, Ooh, where does she live? She lives on the other side of town. How many glasses of wine can I have and Uh still blow less than Uh 0.08? Like all of these things are happening. Hell yeah. And I'm like two days before we even have dinner. Exactly. And, or then you negotiate like, okay, an Uber's 20 bucks. I could spend $40 and not get a DUI. That sounds like a good plan. Oh, good. Then I should bring two bottles of wine because now I'm taking an Uber. Right. Uh, you right. know what I mean? I could have yes. two bottles of wine and maybe even some Jack Daniels and wash that down with them when I get home. <laughs> if I'm making them safe, we'll have a party cocktail because I'm home now. Right. 
I made it safely. The kids yeah. are asleep. I, I can't tell the, the, that's the alcoholism though. Yeah. Because it's cunning and it's sophisticated. And I wouldn't even say that's the alcohol. That's the disease of alcoholism mm, mm-hmm. because that's what it turns into. And, like, and I think yeah. if you think of it as you fighting a drink, then that really dumbs it down. Alcoholism is, by definition, a disability with alcohol. It's an inability to have control, but it tells you that you do. Mm. So it has altered my brain in such a way that I think, oh, I, girl, I got this. I can yeah. just have one glass. But really, my mind is going, oh, girl, you're so cute. Have three. Just take an Uber. Da, 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 da. Right. You can get it. You're fine. Oh, you didn't. You drove home last yeah. time after two bottles of wine. Yeah. And you're fine. You know the back yeah. roads. You know the way to go. You can drive slow. That's yeah. the disease. And, and by the way, so-and-so <laughs> had two bottles of wine at that dinner, so you're not like her. Right. right? That comparison <laughs> There's all part. this comparison. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but so that's, I think, and I think those parts of the negotiation is the, the ism of it. Mm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And we do this all the time. It doesn't even matter. It's like the same thing if you had a bad relationship and you're like, well, I'm just going to call him and tell him about the dog that we share. Maybe he'll then <laughs> take me to dinner. You know, you all these little mini negotiations you have with yes. yourself. Like whenever you're yes. in any addiction, it's the same thing for me with like, I still love food. Right. And I yeah. still have to be around that too. And it's like me going, all right, I can have a donut and breakfast. And if I have a salad at lunch and I feel like right. it cancels it out. You know? Right. <laughs> like right. all these little things. Yeah. All of those things. But but alcoholism, particularly with that disease, is so cunning because it tells you that you're okay, that you can do this. And yeah. and the first step in AA is admitting you have a problem, that you're powerless yeah. over it, right? I mean, that, right. I, I still find it weird. I haven't done any step work with AA. I just go in the meetings and sometimes I just sit there and cry. And sometimes I, like, I gain experience, yeah. strength and hope from other people. And I just learn I desire to go through the steps. It seems to me another part of the process that I am maybe more resistant to because I'm like, I still have that thing where I'm like, well, I'm not like you. You went to jail and have been in rehab three times. Like, I didn't yeah. need to get my shit together. You know, like I yeah. need to stop yeah. drinking, you know? So those steps, and that's where I hear all the sauces. Mm. For me, I'm also, I'm not very religious and it has a lot of religious components to it that sometimes I'm yeah. like, oh, okay. But yeah. I will say this, whether or not I'm religious or not, Something higher than me has pulled me out of this because it's that mm. thing that told me you are better and you're meant for more. And I can't help you if you can't get your own shit together. I can help yeah. you if you don't clean your instrument up so that like you can I can use you the way you need to be used. And so And maybe it's the voice of Jill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, it was Jill. <laughs> I sure love to hear no, that. But, but, but I hear you because I'm not a religious person either. And I grew up very Catholic. But I, I believe in energy. I believe in the universe. I believe in our existence is connected to something greater. Yeah, yes. And there is something greater that wants you, Lauren, to be greater. Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> That's a great way of putting it. Jackie, though, well, let me ask you, what, what instigated you becoming sober? A f- few things. Number one, I'm kind of a dick. When I'm, when, when even just a buzz, like, so if I went to that dinner and I had three glasses of wine, like I didn't have alcohol before, I didn't come home and have more alcohol after. So like that wasn't necessarily part of what I was doing. But if I went to your house and you were just pouring, I've had half a glass of wine and then you poured more into it. And I wasn't actually counting my glasses of wine. Yeah. There's just no discipline whatsoever. Right. But if I had this bottle, that's why I had to have these pre-negotiations. Like, you know, Lauren and I are going to share a bottle of wine. Then I know that I get two and a half glasses. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Oh, right. Yeah. And so it was the constant. And it was also like we were home and it was quarantine. And I wasn't drinking necessarily more often. I would have some weeks that I was and some that I wasn't. But I wasn't being the person I wanted to be. Yeah. But I also went to a friend's engagement party, the surprise engagement. And I just... First of all, I, I talked about how the future groom, uh, who he dated in the past, like at their engagement party. No. Like, just like, it's just Jackie. She's just being funny, you know? Uh-huh. And I didn't like who I was. I didn't yeah. like, like, who does that? And I didn't mean any ill will by it, but right. I, I and, and even that was like three months before I ended up really stopping. But I just saw over and over again that I wasn't a fan of who I was when I was drinking and the the thoughts, the constant, constant thoughts of negotiation. And I just thought, you know what, I'm going to stop for a little while. Like, and I, like you, maybe that I could not say I'm not, I'm done drinking because that would send me into a tailspin and I would just drink. Like, don't tell me what I'm not going to ever do again. Ever do again. (laughs) My favorite person, my favorite thing, my, 
one yeah. activity I can rely on and can get anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And so I just thought, you know what, I'm going to take a break. Mm. And also I have a kid with chronic kidney disease. Mm. And I told myself and anybody who had listened that I was going to stop drinking just in case he needed my kidney. Now he's in like stage two of five. He's managing like there's mm-hmm. knock on wood, right? He's that, all, like, no thanks he, to that he, kidney. Well, thankfully it's the liver that, 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 oh, um, right, right, you know, right, gets right. The, yeah. <laughs> but at the same time I was like, well, if I have to have surgery and I have to blah, 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 you know, and he's not even close to that. But that was what I needed, right? Mm. Because we as women won't necessarily do for ourselves, but we'll do for our children. So I told anyone who would listen, Mm -hmm. oh, well, he could use my kidney one day. And so I better at least stop drinking. It was kind of bullshit. I'm calling myself out right now. But that's what I needed to tell myself, that I was being a good mom. Because if you're being a good mom, at least for me, I'm much more motivated than to say, I should do this for myself. Yeah. Uh, You know? Are yeah. you so motivated and, by your children or are you motivated by you now that you're a little bit deeper into it? You know, for having teenagers, it really helps that I don't want alcohol to be mm-hmm. front and center mm-hmm. in their lives mm-hmm. because I would like them to have a positive relationship. If they want to drink as, you know, yes. as adults at 21 yeah. or whatever, yeah. go for it. Yeah. But I also want to teach them that it's not the end all be all, that you yeah. can live a life, you can have friendships, you can do all these things and not yes. think that, like we were programmed, yes. that alcohol needs to be front and center. Right. And so they don't really think much about it. And honestly, like even the days that they were younger and, oh my God, I, I threw up one time in a public fountain in front of a restaurant in the suburbs of Los Angeles, not even that long ago, like 2008. And, Sounds about right. My yeah, kind of girl. And my, <laughs> Right. And my son had just been in the hospital with asthma. He has that too. And, you know, I came home and and I went to this charity event and I was like, well, I just spent three days in the hospital. Like I need to let loose, you know, and I let loose, I let loose into the fountain. Like the fact that nobody ever like saw me or whatever. I mean, it was so embarrassing. By the way, the fountain's gone. I don't know if it has anything to do with me. (laughs) They're like, this one's got the fact that the the restaurant, the mojito restaurant right in front of it probably wasn't a good mix. Yeah. But I just... I just wasn't really enjoying, especially not having, like you were saying, the social activity. It's different when you're out and you're social and this and that, but like, it just wasn't working for me anymore. Yeah. Right. You know? Right. And and yet to this day, I'm nine months in, you cannot tell me I will never drink again or else I will feel compelled mm-hmm. to drink again. Mm-hmm. So that whole one day at a time thing works for, yeah. <laughs> you know, it you don't have to be an AA for that to work. That's totally true. Because, you know, AA yeah. is for me something I use as just to kind of keep checking in. It's someone I feel accountable to somehow now at yeah. this stage yeah. in the game. I, I just feel like, well, they, they give you a chip. So like, okay, got my 30 to chip yeah. and I want the rainbow. So I like got to yeah. keep going, you know? Yeah. Um, and I, again, their, their whole thing is like experience, strength, and hope. So it's like you you go there and listen to other people and you're like, oh, okay, I can do it another day. You just learn a little bit of something. And the, the thing with AA yeah. is they just say, take what you want and leave the rest, you know? So I take whatever I need that day or yeah. whatever I go and use that. But I don't, like I said, I, it's hard for me to say that I'm in AA because I'm not working the steps the way that most other right. traditional members are. And I, I need to look into that for myself. And maybe one day you will. Maybe one day I will. I, I hope to. I'm always on a quest to learn more about myself, but. It just seems like another commitment <laughs> right now. I'm like, okay, I take it time. What would you tell Lauren 10 years ago about sobriety, about what life can be? You know, there was a time that I thought I would never be able to live without alcohol. Like, why would I do that? That seems completely weird. And now I look back on my life and I can't imagine my life with it, at least the relationship I had with it before. I can't imagine ever having that same relationship with it again. I have lived a life, a really incredible life and doing some of the most amazing things. And I don't remember a lot of it because I was drunk and telling myself I was having fun. And I probably had a great fucking time. I just don't remember any of it. (laughs) And the people who do said I had a great time. Yeah. I just don't remember it. And that for me is so sad. And I want to remember the rest of my life, the, the future that I have. And so I would tell Lauren that really she is really, really great just the way she is, that it, alcohol doesn't add to that. When I posted something about my one-year sobriety, one of my producers from another show I did, she said, wow, Lord, because I said, I thought alcohol made me more fun and beautiful and entertaining and all of the things, and mm. but I didn't drink at work. So 
she said, you were the, my favorite person on set and you were never drunk. And I was like, oh, well, I was like, I'm good when I'm not drunk. You know, like, why do I need yeah. to be drinking? That doesn't add to it. And maybe it does, but it doesn't add to it in any measurable way that people could recognize that. Half the time, one of the things I used to pride myself on was that people didn't know that I was drunk. They would say, oh, you're drunk. I didn't know you were drunk when you were there. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Great. I was skillful at hiding it, yeah, especially like, with my kids. I don't know if I just act drunk when I'm sober, but like they, right. they didn't notice. So at least for me, I was like proud of my skills, right? Like yes. I can hide it. Oh, so girl, yes, to hide it. That way. That's another thing I just want to, going back to this, I would hide it. I would hmm. not let anybody know. I'd brush my teeth really quickly. Or it was like a big old thing, mouthwash. I might even take a sip of that. And sometimes it was in my throat so you couldn't smell the jag dinner. Like, hmm. I would hide it from people on an airplane when you're not supposed to be drinking, but I would hide my little bottles and I'd pour them out. And, you know, all these little sneaky tricks. Yeah. I'd throw the trash away down the street before I threw it in my own trash can. Like, all these little things that I know, like, wow. if you had to do it in secret, it's probably not a good thing. Yeah. How has your family changed since you became sober? There are a lot of champions about my sobriety. There are a lot of people who are so happy and proud for me. You know, it's been easier than I thought it was. I'll just put it that way. Everything's been easier than I thought it was to stop drinking. Like all of the people that I used to drink with that I don't drink with anymore are still my friends if they were really my friends before. But there are certain family members that I have that have really taken advantage of my inability to be present or clear. Now that I'm clear headed and more level headed and aware I'm recognizing some toxic relationships that I had with certain family members. And so mm. in doing what I need to do for myself, which is my own work and taking care of myself, I've had to eliminate a lot of toxicity in my life, whether it be friendships or relationships, whether it be the kind of television or news that I ingest, whether it be the food or whatever that I eat. Like I've had to like really clear out some things that are not good for me. And sometimes yeah. that can be people in your life. And I'm okay with that if I'm yeah. putting myself first. Since getting sober, you've also gotten married. So clearly yeah. you were able to work out some of the yes. things that, I mean, without murdering anyone, you I were able to work murdered. that out? Yes, we have. <laughs> and you know, we're on the other side of it. And when I was entering into our marriage, I was sober. And that was a big thing to put together sober. I was about eight months sober at the time. And we have done some intensive work, but our, our relationship is better than I think it could have ever been. That experience broke me open. I had an opportunity to either choose the best of me or, or not. And I did. Mm. And we both grabbed onto the best parts of our relationship and have utilized that experience to really get a little bit more familiar with who we are and who we want to be and who we want to show up as in this world. And so mm. I am doing my work for myself and he does his work for himself. And I recognized in that, you know, we say the serenity prayer in AA and it's the first thing that, that you say. And I'm sure you see that on every teacup too. Okay. Right. right. It's, but it's yeah. like, and the first line of it is, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And mm. what I'm learning every day is the wisdom in, in what I can change and what I can't change. And I will never be able to control my husband, right? Or my kids or anybody else for that matter. Yeah. What I do know that I can control is me and how I respond and react in this world, mm. how I show up, how I do my own work to do my best. That's my commitment. And that was my commitment entering into this marriage. And same for him. And that's why I accepted that responsibility as being a wife. So powerful. One of the things I've always respected about you is your ability to just be yourself. You're so gifted and, and talented and mm -hmm. brilliant and also being vulnerable and authentic. Thank you. And I think that's why you get these Instagram messages and these people because the more we can talk about our struggles, yeah. the better we'll be and the more connected we'll be. Yeah. If you're curious about beginning your own sober journey and you need support, I will link to some resources in the show notes. And while Lauren herself has found value in AA, she also credits some other places for finding connection, including following different hashtags on social media, as well as sober associations, some specifically for women of color. Visit grownasswoman.guide forward slash episode 168 for more information. The key is finding community, something Lauren credits even today. I think that's really one of the reasons why I wanted to speak out with you, Jackie, is because I told you before I learned in Fab Life, there, there are people, I'm not alone. And there's so mm -hmm. many of us that want to clean up our act. It doesn't even mean that you have to be completely sober. Just clean the act up. There's a calling to bring us forward and to do better. 
And so that's one of the reasons why I wanted to share my story with somebody so that maybe they found some strength in that too. Yeah, Yeah, it's beautiful. And I really want to make sure it's clear that there's so much grace that I have for people who are in the struggle themselves. I think there's so much of that judgment and shame and guilt that's wrapped up into the disease as well that makes people feel like they're inadequate or can't get out of it. And so Mm. I have so much grace for that and for people in that situation because I mean... Listen, I'm only one decision away from going right back to where I started from. Yeah. I really am. And but that also in that same like same. same heaviness of that, there's also just one des- you're only one decision away from changing it too. Yes. Anything you do is a series of a lot of decisions added up to create change, right? And so yeah. for me, it's like I don't look at it like I'm quitting drinking. I just look at it like just for today, I'm not going to have a drink. And if that seems too heavy, then it's just for this hour, I won't have a drink. And a series of hours turns into a series of days. And then a series of days turns into weeks and months and years and all that other stuff. I was in a group with this, I go to, I volunteer now. That's another way I spend my time because for me, Mm. I like being social. I realize that, right? I I can't be at a bar for me. (laughs) Because if I go to a restaurant, Mm -hmm. I'm sitting at the bar, honey. (laughs) Sitting in in a a seat by myself. So I, (laughs) I I volunteer at this woman's shelter. And they're women of color. They're all in, in, in treatment or in therapy and, and are getting help for their addictions. And it doesn't matter if it's drugs or alcohol or prostitution, whatever. You can just get caught up. And I'm witnessing these other women who have had it so much harder than me, right? Just collect their little series of good decisions. Collect their series of good decisions. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you look. I love that. Right? <laughs> and then all of a sudden you look back and you've got a year of them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's anything yep. like it's like anything you want to do to change your life is just about like little decisions. One decision at a time yep. can change it. And so I don't want anyone to like be like, oh, she went to AA and she didn't do all these things. Nope. I just made one decision at a time that just changed it. Just like I was doing when I was staying in my addiction. Amazing. One decision at a time. There are no truer words. But Lauren suggests having a plan and quote, playing the tape forward, thinking about the outcome of your actions in advance. I already know what drinking and getting mm. fucked up looks like for me, right? Let me play the tape forward of like what it doesn't look like for me. If I know if I drink, I'm going to be too loud, be too much, act a fool, pass out, throw up. Somebody's going to drag me out of the bar. I'm going to be wibble wobbly. I'm going to pay <laughs> have an expensive Uber. If that, I could get a DUI. I could kill somebody's kid or somebody or myself or my kids mm. or not drink. And I could have a couple of spritzers. And I could enjoy myself and I could dance and I could remember and I could have engaging conversations with real people about real experiences and I can get home and I can go to sleep and I can wake up and I can do something with my kids early. Like when you play those two tapes together, you're like, oh, right. Okay. Here's the thing. Getting sober comes with some uncomfortable moments and some different decisions. And according to Lauren, it's a daily practice of putting yourself first. I cannot drink, but that comes with a little bit of practice, right? Yeah. You can also stay the hell home. You don't got to go to every party you invited to. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that's a really, really important point is that if you need to in the beginning, not go to social events, it's okay to be first on yeah. your list. It's yeah. okay to say, hey, this is what I'm doing and it's, it's really yeah. too hard for me. And if someone isn't understanding of that, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Then they're not your friends. If you're listening and feel moved to begin your own sober journey, please check out the show notes for resources. I also link to a few non-alcoholic beverages that you can bring to parties and social events and feel like you're having the experience without the alcohol. Thank you so much, Lauren, for sharing your story. I love you so much, Jackie. Thanks so much for listening. If you like this episode, please share it with a friend. It is my mission to provide tools and support for more and more women to embrace their most badass, grown-ass lives. And if you feel inspired, leave a rating and review. That small act makes a huge difference. Unless, of course, you hate the show, then you're welcome to just skip that stuff. Until next time, remember, you are a grown-ass woman. Act accordingly.